Hello, I'm David Marler from Rotterdam University, and today we're going to be talking about formalist criticism. And in this lecture, we're going to be talking about what formalist criticism is. It's also known as formalism and new criticism. We're also going to talk about the use of formalism to analyze texts. We're going to talk about when formalism is important and why it's no longer really popular or used. And you will use formalist criticism to analyze a text that we will study. Before that, I'm going to actually begin with the small history of formalist criticism. It goes back to early 20th century Russia. And in the early 20th century Russia, so around 1915, 1918, the same time that the revolution was going on and the Bolsheviks were taking over Russia and creating a Soviet communist state, a group of academics decided that they wanted to turn literary studies into a literary science. And the way that they wanted to do this was by focusing on the language that is on and used with text. And the reason why they wanted to do that was to determine a type of aesthetic. They wanted to see what was beautiful in a text and what language was used and how language could be used to make a text beautiful. And with this, they wanted to come up with an idea to understand why literature was beautiful, why poems were beautiful. This is often also called poetics. Now, the idea swept through Europe and it became extremely popular in the United States around the 1940s after the Second World War. And this was then called New Criticism. And New Criticism was a form of formalism primarily used in the English language world, and it dominated literary studies up until the 1970s. So in the United States and in the UK, New Criticism became the way that we looked at text and the way that we analyzed text, and also it influenced the way that people studied literature, what they studied and what they found to be important. Now, formalism, formalist criticism, or new criticism all look at a few main topics. The first one is they look at the form of the text, and they do this by ignoring outside sources. So when you're doing a formalist analysis of a text, you're not looking at author, you're not looking at history, you're not looking at the emotions that it gives the reader, you're not looking at the society that produced it. Etc. You're only looking at the text itself, the text as this sterile object that you are going to analyze. And the things that you analyze are primarily issues like style. So how was it written? What words were used? What language was used? You can also look at narration. So was it chosen to be written in the first person, so I or we, or was it written in the third person? And was this narrator, is it limited, is it omnipotent, etc.? There's also something called poetics, which is looking at the structure of a poem. This is looking at things like meter, rhyme scheme, whether there's alliteration, which is kind of rhyming, but the first syllable as opposed to the last of a word. And by doing this, you could look at a poem and see what makes a poem beautiful. What are the rules? You also want to look at aspects of text, like literary devices. These are things like tropes or figurative language, or other things like similes, metaphors, anaphora, different ways, different techniques that writers use when they're writing a text. You then want to look at structures. So let's say that we have a novel where every single chapter is written from someone else's perspective. That's a formless way of looking at how a text should be written. You also want to look at the structure of poems. So what makes a villanella different from a sonnet? And finally, new, uh, new criticism and formalism and formalists, they were extremely obsessed with aesthetics. And they were coming and trying to understand what makes a text beautiful or what makes a text ugly. Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at a select paragraph from the very first page of a text that we're going to read called The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. And from this, we're going to look at page one from The Handmaid's Tale. And what I want you to do really quickly is pause this slide and read the text. Once you're finished, you're going to talk or think about different aspects of the text. So I want you to think about aesthetics. What about narration? How was it written? Was it written in the first person, the third person? What about the form? What kind of language we're using? Are they long sentences? Are they short sentences? 
Do the sentences all begin in a certain way? You can even look at things like punctuation. Are there colons, semicolons, commas, apostrophes, etc.? Look at imagery. So what words are being used and what kind of images do they conjure up in your brain? And finally, you want to focus on language. What are the words that are being used? So pause this right now, read this text. You can also find it on page one of your novel. And then we're going to look at my very short analysis of this chapter. So if we look at an analysis of this text, we can find that I've listed a few things here from the text that I would immediately analyze if I were looking at this in a formalist way. The first one that I notice when I'm reading any text is, what kind of narration do we have? And in this text, we see that it begins with the word we, and we can later see the word I, so we know that it's a first-person text, meaning it's written from someone's perspective. And we can assume from the title that this is The Handmaid's Tale. And if we were not so formalist, we could also see that this is a reference to Chaucer's uh, Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, where each person in The Canterbury Tales had their own tale. Then what I started looking was the use of the semicolons, which are green, but actually has to deal with many independent clauses. So a comma here sometimes leads to a dependent clause, which is one that you can't be, can't be a sentence on its own, but there are a lot of independent clauses, shorter clauses right after each other. And this is very interesting when looking at the form. To me, it almost makes it appear as if the text is verbal. It's almost as if she is writing it in the way that she would say it. Then the brown text here, I was looking at imagery and metaphor. And we can see here that Margaret Atwood uses words like the pungent scent of sweat, shot through the sweet taint of chewing gum and perfume from the watching girls. And she said things like spike, spiky green streaked hair, and a palimpsest of unheard sounds, style upon style, the undercurrent of drums, a forlorn wail. And actually, if we look at a palimpsest of unheard sounds, it's a very strange idea because the word palimpsest is actually a word that means an old text that's been revised, the part that's been deleted. And finally, I was looking at the vocabulary, the words that I have here in orange, where she uses words like after image, undercurrent, forlorn, palimpsest and the way that these words work. This is a way that a formalist would actually analyze a text. But it's also possible to take one theme from a text, for instance, the narration, or the use of the independent clause, or the use of vocabulary, or the use of imagery and metaphor. And this is often in the academic world the basis of one analysis. So you wouldn't have to analyze everything. You can also choose one thing that you want to analyze. You can make that part of your discussion. Now in the 1970s, as I showed earlier, formalism and new historicism became less and less popular. And today in the literary circle, it's very rarely used. It is, however, used and is very important when studying and learning literature, but it's not actually used in the academic world that much as a form of literary critique. And one of the big reasons is because you cannot ignore the outside world. So in the 1970s, especially the feminists, but also deconstructionists and sem people who studied semiotics started saying, well, you can't actually study a text and ignore the author, ignore the history, ignore society, ignore things like sociology and feminism and queer studies. And because of this, new historians, our new criticism became less and less popular. And we have that to thank to two guys from France, very important continental philosophers called Jacques Derrida and Roland Barthes. Now Jacques Derrida was someone who believed in deconstructionism and Roland Barthes was, the, was a forefounder in something called semiotics. And this isn't important because you wouldn't have to know this for the test, but it is important to understand that the way that they've taken formalism and the way that they've changed it. These two French authors believed that language was the most important part and that the art of literature actually happens in the reader. So when I say a word like mother or dog or grass, that those words have a meaning to you because they conjure up a feeling in your head. And so with this study, what we call semiotics, it's important to look at the effect that the text has on the reader and the way that language plays a role in that. 
And we call that semiotics, which is the finding of meaning in language. So this is an important thing to th uh, turn to think about, but it's also something that you can use in the future when you're looking at literature. What is the effect that the work has on the reader? And what, how does language play a role in creating that effect? This is the end of this mini lecture. You can now use formalism to navigate almost every text that's ever been written. And it's a wonderful way to better understand how authors write. And if you yourself are interested in writing, then it's a very important and great way to learn how to become a better writer yourself by seeing the tricks and the ways that other authors use language to make their work better. Thank you very much.